Mina, konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Here with the Sunday message, and I actually remember to start the timer that time. A little bit late, but I actually still remembered. Coming at you with um, some heavy news, unfortunately. And, uh, well, it's it's not new news. It's it's old news. Uh, it's, re it's relatively new. But anyway, just I've been thinking about some of the things that have been going on in the nation and in the world recently, I'm just like, man, we've had a very rough past two months um, with Christina Grimmie's, yes, I have notes over here, Christina Grimmie's death on June the 11th, then the Orlando shooting the very next day, then there was the shooting in Texas at the Black Lives Matter rally on July 7th, and then the shooting and Nice, or the drive-by shooting, bombing, at Nice, France, on July the 14th. A lot of bad stuff is going on in the world at this time. And there are, of course, you know, and that's on top of all of the wars, all the unrest, all the, all the plagues, droughts, famines, that occur on the world on a regular basis. And in the middle of all this stuff, you hear a lot of preachers, particularly in the Christian evangelical church, saying, Jesus is coming soon. The end draws nigh. Repent, ye sinner, and be saved. I have no problem with the repent and be saved part. I quite agree with that part. What I would take issue with is the whole the end is nigh part. Now, I want to cover a lot of scripture tonight. So, And it's Sunday, so I have the time to do that. But I am not so sure that the end is nigh. In fact, I believe we have a little ways to go. I don't think it's... I, there's a doctrine within the church called the imminence of the Lord's return. And what that doctrine states is that Jesus could come at literally any second. What that would mean is everything is ready, everything is primed and pumped, and we have no idea when Jesus is going to come back, and he could come back at any second. I don't agree with that teaching. I personally do believe in the Lord's second coming. There is a doctrine. I'm going to throw this in there just kind of like as a little, you know, chew on this, think about it. There is a doctrine in the Christian church. It's small, but it's not stupid, called preterism that believes the Lord has already come and that the prophecies in the New Testament and the Old were already fulfilled around 70 AD and that Jesus' second coming is already past. And done. And it's worthy of note because um, I know some people that are preterists. They're not stupid people. They have well thought out arguments. There are a few loopholes in some of the way they interpret um, some of the verses, but from what I can tell, that's the way it is for every single eschatological view. Now, that's a really big word that encapsulates everything that I'm talking about tonight. Eschatology is the study of the end times, the end of days, the last of days, eschatology, and then the study from that is eschatological. So really big, fancy sounding word. Did my intelligence go up about five? Well, I don't need any dark souls. Me, strong man, me, sword and shield. <laughs> References. I'm getting good too. Anyway, totally tangent. Eschatology. That's what I want to talk about tonight, because I don't believe that the Lord's return is imminent. I think that the signs spoken of in the New Testament, one, they are for the future, not for the past. I do not agree with my preterist brothers and sisters. And that puts me in the majority, I feel like strangely for once, in that particular sect, that the Lord is coming back in the future. And that leads into many, many passages in the New Testament that I'm going to cover I'm going to try to do it a little bit in-depth again. It's a Sunday. I have the time to do it. I will not be covering the Antichrist specifically. You can find mention of him in pretty much the entire book of 2 Thessalonians is devoted to the Antichrist. And 1 John, in a few places here and there, mentions the Antichrist, as well as Antichrist in the plural. And I believe it also mentions the Antichrist spirit and things coming in the name of Antichrist. So... It's not as direct as 2 Thessalonians, but it still deals with the topic of a specific one-person antichrist, a literal human form 
of just someone who absolutely and totally agrees with Satan and rebels against God. And then you also have the mentioning of the new heavens and the new earth and the book of Revelation and the burning up of the elements of this world in 2 Peter. I'm not going to be covering those either. What I want to focus on are the... Uh, symbols isn't the right word. I want to focus on the signs. Well, I guess symbols is the right word. Mentioned in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I have my little notes on the side here. I tried to do a little bit of prep for today's message. So we're going to start with Matthew chapter 24. Focusing on the signs of his return and the signs of his coming. And what are the signs that indicate we are in the last days and in the end times? It is important to know, especially with so many preachers out there screaming that, you know, he is coming back, you know, and the rapture is imminent. There's a very popular term in evangelical Christianity, the rapture, where all Christians are caught up in the blink of an eye, and then they will be forever with the Lord, and then there are seven years of tribulation. I'll get to that near the end of the message. I want to focus on the signs in general for now, because so many bad things are happening, and with this... I can see the emphasis. It hasn't arisen in my personal church, but I can do it. And I, it's not like I've surfed online, like what are, what's the rest of the church talking about at this particular time. But just knowing how the church functions and having been in more old-timey churches back in the day, these things tend to come up when life gets really, really hard. And they'll tell the people, you know, don't worry, the Lord's coming we're going to be caught away in the blink of an eye, and we won't have to worry about the sinful world anymore. Have those signs come to pass? Is Jesus' return imminent? Let's get into that. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 3. Now, there's going to be a lot of reading in Matthew 24 and Mark and Luke. So, again, it's a 30-minute message, so please bear with me and enjoy the message. Let's dig into the Word of God together. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Very first thing, take heed that no one deceives you. Be aware, be cautious, be informed. People are going to try to deceive you, catch you off guard. And he is, since he saw him to his disciples, I would say, Believers, this is really addressed more to us than to the non-believer. This, and of course, the non-believers really don't care what the Bible or Jesus had to say, so it's not like they'd really be listening to end times talk anyway. Although this message is definitely for the unbelievers as well, whoever wants to watch is more than welcome, and I do want to be a voice kind of going against what the church uh, on a big scale is saying, because I don't believe it's correct. I believe the church has missed this one. So, since that's the case, I want to raise up my voice and say, hey, I have another opinion. I believe it's informed. Let me leave it up to the audience to judge. Um, both, And this will be a voice for the non-Christian to say, hey, there's one guy who's not just, you know, screaming, you know, the end is nigh. Repent. I'm still saying repent, so I'm not, you're, not, you're not off the hook for that part. <laughs> you still need to do that even if the end is not nigh. The call to repentance goes out to all people of all ages and all times. Going back to verse 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Focus on that for just a second. Um, I'll read the other passages and the other two books. They're very similar to this, and I want to read it so you will see it. There are two interpretations of this verse. One, people coming and saying that I'm, you know, I'm Jesus, kind of like Charles Manson did. And just something, and there are actually many people who do claim to be Jesus or God, and they're crazy people. They are off their rocker. Some people think if you believe in religion, you're kind of crazy. I mean, I don't fit into the cultural and societal norm on many levels. Um, you've seen my talk on my conservative Christianity, my views against abortion, against homosexuality, so I certainly don't fit in the mainstream on several issues. To call me completely insane, I'm not frothing at the mouth, um, while I do believe in signs and wonders, and I do believe I hear the voice of God, uh, I'm one of those guys, so I'm, I'm, pre I'm pretty close to crazy. I'm pretty close, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I'm still in control of myself. I'm in control of my life. I can make coherent speech. I make sense when I talk. 
I know what I'm doing for the most part, and I can, I'm trying to figure out the parts that I don't understand. To call me insane for believing in Jesus, mm, you can believe that I'm intellectually inferior, which I believe is a weak argument, and you can believe I'm simply wrong and deluded, and i not hearing the things that I think I'm hearing. Um, I am wrong to believe the things I believe. You're absolutely entitled to believe that, and there, honestly, I can see why atheists believe some of the things that they do. I don't believe they're right, and they have their weak arguments as well and their weak stances, but I can see where they're coming from. That doesn't make them crazy for them to not believe in God, from my perspective. Hopefully, I'm not crazy in their eyes for believing in a God and believing in the things that the Bible talks about, like miracles, healings, the voice of God, etc. The second interpretation for this and I'm not sure which I believe. I think both have their strong points because many have come saying that they are Jesus or they're God in the flesh, and we need to listen to them. But another interpretation is they will come that saying that Jesus is the Christ. They'll come in his name, saying, yes, Jesus is Lord, and will deceive many. Christians proclaiming false doctrines, false truths. And yes, that was a rebuke to people who are saying that Jesus is coming right now. He could come at any minute. The church is going to be taken away, and you need to repent. Yes, Jesus is Lord. One day he will come. One day he will take us away. Yes, sinners need to repent. And hopefully if you're listening to this and you're not a believer, hopefully you won't tune me out and you'll stay tuned in for this message. But when they are trying to tell people that Jesus is coming, therefore repent, because he could come at any minute, kind of like that, that, a little, uh, that push. I don't mind pushing people in an intellectual argument or an intellectual conversation. I don't even mind pushing, pushing people in some emotional arguments and conversations. You know, I'm pretty outspoken, I'm pretty loudmouthed, and I, like any other human, like to have my way. But it's the deception part. It's the being in the wrong part that I'm concerned about. And for people to use that Jesus is coming soon, so accept him, so we can escape all the problems in this world, I have a big problem with that mentality. It's not just the Jesus coming soon part that I think is wrong. It's the let's get away from all these problems and not have to deal with it. That's the real problem. Some Christians, some pastors even, I'm afraid, use the doctrine of Jesus' coming to say, well, we can't do anything about the world, so don't bother voting in the next election, which could be incredibly important for this nation. Maybe the most important one we've ever had. Several people would agree with me on that, both on the believer and non-believer side. You know, don't worry about working in the world. Some of you have gone so far as to say, you know, sell all your worldly possessions. We'll live in this little commune. The world's only going to last a few more years. People have done that so many times in the past. And those all, because those are so, so definitely immediate, they always end in ruin, um, end with people bankrupt, confused, wounded. I've even heard a few very sad stories where people decide, you know, well, Jesus is coming at this particular time, so let's, you know, let's, um, like, you know, let's uh, drink this poison or inject this drug or let's jump off this roof or off this building and we'll literally be caught in midair. Our bodies will be immortalized before the poison has its effect and, you know, it'll just be this cool little kind of like, hey, hey, I told you so to everyone around us who thought we were crazy. Well, they just ended up being plain crazy. And then the people who aren't as crazy as those two groups, but it is much more prevalent. And because of that, somewhat more dangerous. The people who say that we shouldn't get involved in this world, we shouldn't try too hard, we shouldn't push too much, let the sinners be sinners and let them do what they're going to do. We don't need to worry about evangelizing. The world's completely messed up and it's only going to get worse. So we just need to lock ourselves in our church, maybe maybe reach out to some other churches who feel the exact same way as we do and we'll just kind of huddle up together and our little Christian group will be good Christians and we'll wait for the Lord to come back. And that is completely wrong. We are told to go out and evangelize this world. We are told to go out and make a difference as believers in Christ. We are told to be the salt 
and the light. All throughout the entire New Testament, we see the apostles and the disciples and just the Joe and Jane Christians going out, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, living their lives for the Lord. And they did believe that they were living in the last days. Peter mentions that in the book of Acts, that they were in the last days then. When Jesus sent the Spirit, boom, that's a sign that we're in the last days. That was about 2,000 years ago. We're still in the last days. And the signs that Jesus talks about have not come to pass yet. And the attitude of getting away and escaping, I have a real problem with. If every sign had happened, which I don't believe it has, if everything Jesus mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already come to pass, and Jesus wasn't here, at that point, I'd be one of those crazy preachers saying, Jesus could come back at any time. Uh, you guys really need to repent. You really need to wisen up here. But that's the whole thing. I'd be out there preaching. I wouldn't be huddled away. I'm, I'm kind of sort of huddled away in my room being a geek and an otaku. But at the same time, I'm using YouTube to reach out to all you guys and to say, Hey, the kingdom of heaven is on its way. Jesus has come and he offers repentance. Get in on that. It's a good deal. You get heaven and him forever. And it's so wonderful and you, it's important. You need to get in on this. So even though I am in my little hidey hole and I have the four corners of my room, I am in my own way reaching out. And it's, this, and it's the escapist attitude. That's the most worrying and the most damaging part of the deception that he's, you know, that he's coming soon, he could come at any time, so we don't need to do anything. Could not be farther from the truth. So those are the two points from verse 5 and people saying, I am the Christ. And the two interpretations that come from that, moving on to verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The, the end is not yet. There are definitely things that we can look out for. There are things that we can anticipate. There are things that Jesus has warned us about. So even though we're in the last days, the end is not yet. It's not imminent. It's not right here. You see all these troubling things, and these are not here. He goes on in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So all the horrible things that happen in the world with wars, natural disasters, these things are going to keep on happening in various places. And according to some believers, and maybe some scientists, I'm not sure, Google's your friend. I've said that so many times, and I'm going to keep on saying it because it's true. Apparently, those things have increased within the last several years. Those things are getting worse. The world is getting worse on many levels, human and um, geological. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. We may be in the last days, but we're not at the end. We may be in the last chapter. We're not at the end. We haven't reached the last page, much less, much less the last paragraph, the last sentence, the last word, and the, the end at the end. We're not there yet. We're at the beginning of sorrows. So there are things that we can look out for. And then continuing on in verse 9, and these signs are located a lot in the New Testament, some in the Old Testament as well. And I believe some of the things that are written here can be looked for in the world today. So, moving along, and holy smoke, time does fly. Then they will deliver you, Jesus referring to his disciples there, and I do believe by extension, us, up to tribulation and kill you. By the way, martyrdom is alive and well in the modern church. More people, more Christians, died for their faith in Jesus in the 20th century than the previous 19 centuries before it. Please Google that. Please see if that statement is true. From what I have studied and from what I have gathered, that is a true statement. A very sad but true statement. So even that part, happening right now, getting worse. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many again. 
Pro again, falseness, lies, deceit. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And I know myself, in the years that I walked away from the Lord, because of all the bad stuff I saw happening, my love grew cold. I ended up walking away from the Lord for a little while. And I was at fault. I was completely in sin and completely wrong for that. Very glad I'm back. Very glad I went to that camp and came even cleaner than I was before. Now I am squeaky clean and completely surrendered to God. And that's a very, very good place to be. And then verse 13. I've said this to you guys many, many times. I keep telling you Google's your friend. Well, you get to hear it right from my lips and right from the Bible itself. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew 24 Verse 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That reference is in, I use that in reference to enduring to the end of your trial, to the end of your problem, maybe even to the end of your particular life itself. So he who endures to the end will be saved. And Jesus is referring to the end of like the whole world. So how much more all the little things? He who endures to the very end in light of all of the stuff that he just mentioned, Wars, famines, pestilences, and martyrdom for Christian believers. In the midst of all that, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Let that sink in for just a minute. I know most of the people that I'm communicating with are not in situations half as bad as the stuff that I'm talking about here. I'm sure a handful of you are. Well, right now, since my channel is small, probably none. But as the channel grows, as the channel gets bigger, um, God willing. There will be people in the most desperate of times and straits. But let's be honest, the vast majority of us, myself included, we're not in times nearly that bad. The things that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, my heart goes out to those people, and I am sorry for what's happened. Me personally, June and July, God's been changing my life. God's been rearranging things and turning things upside down. The light that's in me has increased greatly. I've been greatly blessed in the last two months. I'm very sorry for what's happened in the world. I myself, I've been very blessed during these times. And I'm, I'm very thankful and humbled by that fact. So, I know I'm definitely not in some horrible situation. And the majority of you watching this, you're not either. Not saying that your problems aren't real, but giving you a little... And I'm not saying that, you know, well, things could be so much worse off. You know, you could be so much worse off, so stop complaining. I don't think that's a really good argument because someone out there is the worst off, and I want to minister to that person as well. However, I would like everyone listening to me to take into perspective their own life and say, are things really that bad? Because most of the time, honestly, they're not. They're not nearly as bad as you think they are in comparison with a lot of the things that are happening in the world. And for those of you who are in you know, the Texas shootings, who are in the Nice uh, drive-bys, massacres. For those of you who are in the middle of actual tribulation and death, my thoughts and my prayers are with you. Please hang in there and rest assured that if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you endure to the end, if you do keep the faith, if you finish the race, you will be saved. Please keep fighting the good fight. Please keep hanging in there. Please keep enduring. You're leaning on Jesus' words here, not mine. And you can take everything he says to the bank. And then verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And that went by, time always goes by much quicker for me than I anticipated going. So in the middle of all this tribulation, in the middle of all this persecution, the gospel of the kingdom is going to go into all the world into the, all the nations, and then the end will come. So in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of, the, in the middle of so many believers dying to persecution and being killed, the gospel is going to proceed and spread and cover the face of the planet. In the middle of the darkest times, the kingdom will rise and it will shine, and it will shine brighter and brighter in juxtaposition to the darkness that's trying to quelch it and stop it. One final note to those who talk about the rapture and Jesus' imminent return. 
I don't believe we've seen those signs yet. I don't believe that the world is nearly as bad as it needs to be before Jesus comes back. Um, there's so much more to go into. Oh my gosh. There is a verse that mentions, like, as in the days of Noah, so shall the end times be. Didn't find that verse prior to this message, and I apologize for that. But it says in Genesis 6, the whole world was filled with violence in the days of Noah. So, despite how horrible these various shootings and drive-bys, etc. are, that's not happening literally everywhere in the world. The world isn't filled with violence. And also in Noah's day, it was Noah and his family. Right now, at this moment, there are millions of Christians who are trying their hardest to live for Jesus and to love Him. And in addition to that, there are also billions of lost people who aren't out to kill their neighbor and out, just out for everything that they can get and out to hurt other people. Yes, they are in sin to my fellow believers, but they're not actively trying to hunt other people. They're relatively peaceful. So the world being filled with violence, we're not there yet. That's one big sign that we haven't hit. Just to list a really big one. And, so, and the severity of the things Jesus was talking about, the end will come after all of these. As these horrible things continue and go on and on and on, then the end will come. As, far as, as for the rapture, I don't believe in it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that's, that's a false doctrine and another false hope. A lot of mainstream Christianity nowadays believes that. I do not think that is correct. I don't believe that to be true. Now, to those of you who are not believers, if you hear one day that millions of people vanished without a trace into nothing, let me tell you, that was the second coming of Jesus. You need to repent as soon as you hear of this event. If you live through all the car crashes, and plane crashes, and train crashes, and boat crashes, and all the other crashes that will occur during a time when millions of people just disappear out of nowhere, if you live through that event, let me, tell you, let me be one of the first to tell you that you just, that was the second coming of Christ, that was the rapture, I was wrong when I preached this message on YouTube, and you need to repent and get saved right now. And even though I don't believe in a rapture, even though I don't believe Jesus' return is imminent, that message goes out to you all right now. You need to repent right now. Times are very bad. Apparently they're going to get worse. If you can believe the Bible. Heck, even if you don't believe in the Bible, I think uh, there's a lot of evidence in the world to, to point in that direction. You need to repent now. As I've said in a few previous messages, you don't know when your time is. You don't know when you're going to die. And stand before God and be judged? You, you don't know. So with that in mind, if my words are resonating with you, if this message has resonated with you, if you're hearing the call to repent in your heart, let me just extend a hand to you right now and extend it where you can see it in the camera. Let me just extend my hand to you right now and say, come. Come to Jesus right now. Come as you are. You don't have to be perfect right now. You don't have to be perfect tomorrow. But the fact that you want to repent of your sin, the fact that you want to be sorry. That's what counts the most. To repent, it, it, what that means is to, to turn away from your sins or the wrongs you've done. To turn away from those bad things and to turn to Jesus. who died on the cross, shed his blood so all those sins could be washed away and so that you could be forgiven. And he also rose again three days later because he conquered sin. He conquered death. And we are guaranteed eternal life in heaven, with him, forever and ever, all good stuff. Whether he comes in this life or whether he does not and he postpones his time as he has done for the past 2,000 years. If he tarries a little bit longer, don't wait. Believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be saved right now. And if you want a model prayer to follow, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I know whether you come in this life or not, I want to be with you. Please forgive me, Jesus, for all the bad things I've done. I believe you died on the cross so I could be forgiven. And I believe you rose three days later, guaranteeing me eternal life in heaven and guaranteeing me that I will one day rise up again when you do come again. 
Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you did for me. Help me from this day forward to live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, that's awesome. Welcome to the family believers. Welcome to the body of Christ. It is good to have you. Find a group of people, a church, that also believes that Jesus is Lord, that believes the Bible is the Word of God. People who believe the same thing as you, to encourage you, to help strengthen you, to pray for you, to just walk with you and live life with you. Find people who believe the same thing as you. If you're on my channel, by all means, hit me up in the comments section. Let me know that you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. That would so encourage me. and Let me know that this message has reached some people. That would be awesome. And if I may also encourage you, if you're watching this video online, you probably have access to other things like Amazon.com where you can buy a Bible and you can read that every day. Buy a Bible. Commit yourself to reading it. Also, make sure to shoot up a prayer to God every day. And with that, hey, saying something like, hey God, how are you doing today? God, I need some help. Things aren't going too well at my school, at my workplace, in my, in my marriage, in my finances. I need some help. Something that simple as a prayer. Shoot those up. God listens to all the small stuff. You don't have to be wordy. You don't have to be verbose. Ooh, that was a $50 word at least. God hears the simplest, smallest prayers, and he cares about each and every one of them because he cares about the person who's praying them. And also, in light of what I said earlier, keep a heart of thanksgiving. Now that you're a Christian, you've been accepted by God. You are God's son or daughter, and you're God's friend. And he loves you so much, he died for you. If nothing else, we can be thankful for that. If you are struggling through the horrible things that I mentioned earlier, pestilence, war, tribulation, something close to home, someone you know was killed, you yourself are dying of cancer. You still know Jesus is Lord. You still have eternal life in Him. You will be with Him forever in heaven. There is still much to be thankful for, even when everything is going bad and everything is going wrong. There is still a way to be thankful and there is still a way you can say, God, I thank you, I praise you, I worship you because despite how bad this world is, despite how bad my body is, despite how bad my neighbors are, despite how bad my government is, you're good and you love me. If you can't thank him for anything else, you can thank him for that. And thank you guys very much for watching this video. I love you, and God bless.